Coming up, Karina Longworth joins Ileana in just a minute. Welcome to Popcorn Talk, featuring movie discussion, news, and interviews. Popcorn Talk. We talk movies. And now, it's the I Blame Dennis Hopper podcast, starring Ileana Douglas. Eavesdrop with Ileana as she interviews Hollywood's most prominent players about filmmaking, acting, and what really happens on the set of your favorite flicks and TV shows. Why, hello there. It's Ileana Douglas. Welcome to the I Blame Dennis Hopper podcast. I'm here with my lovely co-host, Tamara Berg. Not that anybody would know. Do not adjust can't see your set. <laughs> we have a very special uh, episode today. It's all radio all the time. It is. Uh, we have uh, Karina Longworth on the show today, who in addition to writing a number of books, uh, writes, produces, does this wonderful podcast, which is a huge hit uh, called You Must Remember This, all about the great stories of Hollywood. Yeah. And uh, she, she suggested that we do it uh, you know, audio only. We do it audio only. Yeah. So hopefully that doesn't throw anyone. Uh, if if you would like to know, I am I am uh, sort of cash today. Yeah, it's Casual Friday here. It's casual Friday, <laughs> vintage top. Uh, so so much to uh, to go on uh, to talk about. Yeah. Um, first of all, obviously Doris Day who passed. And just what an incredible icon she was, and what a legacy she has left. And do uh, you have some favorites of her work? Yeah, my favorite movie of hers is "Love Me or Leave Me." Uh, I just think that is incredible with James Cagney. She's mm. so good in that movie. Uh, I do love Pillow Talk. Pillow Talk, I think, was the one of the first movies of of my life that I ever saw. I remember watching it on TV. Yeah, and just. First of all, thinking everyone was so beautiful. Yeah. And I loved the, you know, the idea of the split screen. I thought it was amazing. And she had this great, and, you know, and, and the, uh, the way she wore her, uh, you know, her hair and her, yeah. those Jean Louis uh, gowns, you know, yeah. that were so, and they re, they changed her image. But she had a very interesting career starting at, uh, you know, being a, a singer. Mm-hmm. I mean, a very kind of tough on the road life oh, yeah. and uh and then at warner brothers and she had her sort of early warner brothers movies and then you know this whole change in her career of the 60s uh the, those kind of 60s movies that she did with rock hudson and james garner um remember <laughs> glass bottom boat was another one right oh was she in that one i don't remember that one yeah um jim garner <sighs> midnight lace well and then of course the uh the hitchcock mm the Hitchcock one, the man who knew too much, so good in that. And then there's and plus her songs are so um, amazing. The uh, of course her, you know, she was the first. We featured her on Trailblazing Women. She was the the first uh, celebrity to uh, fight for animal rights wow. and animal welfare yeah back you know back in the 60s when, when nobody was, had ever heard of it exactly and starting dog rescue and being kind to animals and um she was an incredible pioneer in that world like you say yeah yeah the first amazing and so it's amazing you know like i was saying you know said like you think of all the i mean in addition to all the movies and joy she brought people the amount of animals that she was able to save and rescue. And up until the end of her life. I mean, yeah. she did that for, for her whole life. Yes. So I want to see Love Me or Leave Me. That's going to be my tribute. Mm. Um, and then, of course, today, Tim Conway. Ugh. How sad from the Carol Burnett show. So much a part of our lives. And just when everything was... It was so... You know, was, I was listening to NPR and they were doing his bio. And as part of his bio... They mentioned that he couldn't, con- he would improv and he couldn't contain himself and he would break up all the other uh, actors on the set. And I thought, well, that's not a bad way to be remembered. <laughs> like that you were. Exactly. <laughs> that you were, you were, you, you, you know, could, had, broke up Harvey Gorman and couldn't, couldn't stop him. That oh is my God. an amazing legacy, I yeah. think. Yeah. He was fantastic on that. And then going back to, uh, my God, they, which they don't even show anymore, Mikhail's Navy. Mm. It's a whole host of shows that they, uh, that used to play in New York in the 1980s, like the Honeymooners and mm-hmm. Mikhail's Navy and Bilko. And I, 
See, I'm just sort of curious if anyone knows, like, where do those shows go? Why are they not, you know, on Amazon Prime or Hulu? Oh, or, right. I don't know. The, the Honeymooners has sort of, you know, got, kind of gone out of fashion. Favor, since. yeah. So I, I hope someone is out there that can bring them back. Uh, very quickly, if you'd like to come see me, I will be in Pittsburgh June 13th at the Heinz Center. Uh, we're going to be celebrating uh, Lois Weber. Uh, the wonderful director from the silent era. And this was the box set that I did with uh, Kino Lorber and Shelley, historian Shelley Stamp uh, curated and did an excellent job. So I'm going to be interviewing her uh, at the Heinz Center June 13th. So please come out and to, to see me if you're around. And, uh, and then June 15th, I'll be going to Connecticut for the Woo-hoo! first gay pride parade. Be the grand marshal. Look at you. Of that. And uh, that'll that'll kick off my summer festivities. Uh, I should say so. <laughs> uh, do you know what you're wearing yet? I don't. I'm something in the ro- something rainbow ish. I think, right? Should, I should I should think so. And I know uh, I know something with big, very big hair. That'll be uh, <laughs> and uh, and very lastly, very quickly, because I can't really talk about it. But they had the uh, with the Goliath rap party mm. and. There are these little inside things in uh, show business that endear me to show business, and I absolutely love, and they are my absolute favorite thing. And if they ever go out of fashion, I don't know what I'll do. But uh, they have, a, you know, at the wrap party, in addition to lots of fried food, <laughs> yay! They show the gag reel. Oh yeah. And I don't know why it just it, it's so inside and it would only, you know, it only and they devote so much time to making a great gag reel and yeah. it's literally only for the rap party. You never yeah. see it again. Yeah. But man is it funny. Um and I just love that tradition, you know. I wonder if they always if they had gag reels. I mean they have people's flubs and movies and things like that, but Yeah. There's just something uh wonderful about the gag reel and seeing oh. people kind of drop character and of be, course. be funny and uh, it, it is one of the delights, of course. But uh, I, I, but it was funny. I was, I was getting complimented on the on my gag reel performance. Oh, good for you! <laughs> Excellent. Um, two things I yes. wanted to mention. One was uh, Peggy Lipton also passed away this week. Yes, Peggy Lipton, uh, the beautiful oh, and talented Peggy. Lipton. I know from so the Mod another. Squad. Yeah. Although oh I didn't my God. get the I, channel growing up. I, uh, I don't remember. I think maybe my older sister watched it, but I remember just being in awe of her because she was so Stunning. beautiful and like doing stuff like making things happen and yeah. she was hanging with the guys and i really admired that so that's another one that's a sad passing i know well, um, they all go up to heaven i um, heard there was a simpsons oh happened. my goodness how could i forget <laughs> Yes, that was this past Sunday. That was a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, gosh, I enjoyed that. And uh, it was a cliffhanger. It was a cliffhanger. So who knows what will what will happen oh, to uh, Crystal Blue Persuasion. My favorite uh, part was watching uh, Werner Herzog. God, he was hysterical. But that show is amazing, and it, it's been on for so long. And there's still... Uh, you know, they just do such a great job. They're so hip. Every cell yeah, no is just uh, done, and there's little funny inside jokes. You could watch it a million times and just see inside jokes every time. Yes, yeah. inside joke after inside joke after it's inside great. joke. It's great. But uh, it was terrific. I was honored to be um, a part of The Simpsons. Woo-hoo! And our wonderful uh, Dave Merkin, who has been here. Yes, on the show, we love Dave. He been, should come back. We should bring him back. Too. I know we got to bring a lot of people. We're ha- having a big anniversary coming up. We sure so, are. Uh, well, let's bring in Karina Longworth. I'm excited about this. It's going to be really fun. We've never met, so it's like kind of be like a blind date. Karina Longworth is a writer, a historian, and, of course, a very famous podcaster. She is the creator and the producer of Host and of You Must Remember This, a podcast on the secret and forgotten history of 20th century Hollywood, as well as the author of many books, uh, including books on George Lucas, Al Pacino, Meryl Streep, and her latest book is Seduction, Sex, Lies, and Stardom in Howard Hughes' Hollywood. Please welcome Karina Longworth. Thank you. Hi, thanks for having me. My pleasure. Now, as I've said, I kept saying to you, your name everywhere I went, 
Even, even though you you you, you want to deny it, but it, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> but wherever I went, people kept saying, "Do you know Karina Longworth? I feel like you guys would get along. It was like a date." <laughs> So eventually I reached out to you and I said, uh, it's come up like three times. So um, thanks so much for coming to the show. Did, but did sure. you ever, was that ever reciprocal or were that, was that only for me? Did I think you? so, yeah. And, you know, I mean, I, I've, I've gone to events that you've done stuff at over the uh -huh. years. I remember, I think it was last summer when they showed the last movie at um, uh -huh. the American Cinema Tech. You introduced it. That you know, was... So obviously we have overlapping interests. Yes. <laughs> Do you miss, uh, did you go to Cine Family? Oh, yeah. I mean, I actually hadn't been the last couple of years. Like, yeah. I find, found myself not wanting to make the drive to sit in the uncomfortable seats unless the programming was really special. Right. Um, but just the fact that there's nobody doing that programming anymore is, is really disappointing. Thank God there's the new Beverly, at least. Yeah, they've had a really good program this month, specifically because they've been focusing on female directors. Yes. Yeah, they have. Didn't they show um, uh, the one I missed? Um, it's my turn. Yeah, I saw that last week. It was great. It was. Yeah, I, I, I missed it. And I kind of was so it held up. Yeah, I really thought so. Yeah. Uh, see, those are the movies of my youth that yeah. my mom would take me to, and they were like fem those. Those were our female empowerment movies. Totally. You know. Um, all right, now let's get serious here. <laughs> Do you remember the first uh, movie you saw and who took you to see it? I don't remember specifically because my mom started taking me to the Disney animated re-releases when I was too young to remember. Uh -huh. And so they all kind of blur together mm. for me. I re remember flashes of being in Fantasia and Bambi and, yeah. and several other ones. The first live action film I remember seeing was Follow That Bird. Oh, um, bird, the, it was a, a Sesame Street movie oh. starring Big Bird on mm -hmm. like a journey. And I, I grew up in Studio City and I remember seeing it with my mom at uh -huh. the movie theater that used to be on Ventura Boulevard that is now a bookstore. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh, right. I know that yeah. one. <laughs> um, so my second question, which Dear maybe Laurel. seem obvious, you are so young. <laughs> and how did you get this interest in old movies? Well... I mean, I think I'm actually kind of maybe the last generation that for which it wasn't that strange, um, uh -huh. especially growing up in Los Angeles, you know, all of or not all of, but many stars from the golden era were still alive. And I mean, one of my first memories is of my mom explaining to me who Rock Hudson was and what AIDS was. And yeah. I must have been four or five years old. <laughs> um, but, you know, like what Bob Hope was doing that day was on the local news. What Elizabeth Taylor was doing was on the local news. Oh, and right. and you'd Great. like go. I mean, every dry cleaner, every pizza place, like everywhere yeah. you went in town had framed photos of these people. And so it just became this thing of like you, you need to know who the presidents are you need to know who the state capitals are you need to know who won best actress you know <laughs> i used to be so jealous because i had a friend who went to beverly hills high mm -hmm. and so he would always say you know in the, in the oscars like I, I that's one of the perks of living in la mm -hmm. is like the oscars is all day long you know, they're covering <laughs> it and yep. you know they have they, they would have the before shows right around three see they don't they i don't know if now things have changed but like back in the day they didn't we only had the oscars so right they didn't have like you know following the stars around and getting the cars with them and stuff like that do you have any recollection like the first time i came to la i saw uh Elizabeth Scott oh, wow. at a gym. <laughs> oh my God! <laughs> on Pico, I was like, I, I, yeah. I, I was freaked out, and I eventually, and then I saw her again. I didn't go up to her, but then I saw her again, and then I did go up to her, and she was very nice. Yeah. Uh, but like that, you know, new people don't interest me. But <laughs> did you have sightings like that? I don't really remember, um, but my grandfather was best friends with the actor Mike Farrell from mm -hmm. MASH, you yeah. know, and so we kind of grew up knewing him and his wife, Shelley Fabres. Mm -hmm. Fabre. Yeah. I'm yeah. friends with Mike and Shelley. Oh, cool. Yeah. So, um, you know, I'm sure there are other people like that around, but I was sort of too young to mm -hmm. recognize. Did you have, when you were growing up, uh, did you have movie books, you know, mm -hmm. where you were like what how did the uh how did the sort of love of movies or and then writing about movies because that's a particular skill in itself yeah um well i my parents had books on the shelves you know they had um like 
uh, Lauren Bacall's autobiography. They had books about James Dean and Natalie mm -hmm. Wood, and they had Hitchcock Truffaut. And so those were some of the first books I just pulled off the shelf and, and read, you know, like when I learned how to read. And um, so I was always surrounded by that, and I always thought that was a cool thing to have in your house. Yeah. Um, and then when I was a teenager when TCM started and when AMC started, um, and so I started, you know, seeing movies that way. But I had already been exposed to a lot of stuff because my parents um, were really strict about the new movies that I was allowed to see. Mm -hmm. But they there was almost no restrictions about things that I could rent from the video store or stuff that I could watch on TV. And we didn't have HBO or any premium channels when I was growing up except for the Disney Channel. And the Disney Channel used to do... I don't think it was called Disney Channel After Dark, but it was that kind of <laughs> idea where they would show adult movies, uh -huh. uh, you know, after 8 p.m. or something. And their adult movies were things like Topper and It Happened One Night and, oh. and these sort of Hollywood classics yeah. that were not, you know, sort of too adult for kids if they were in the audience. And did you have, w w w you know, were you uh, isolated in this or, mm. you know, because like when I was growing up and I watched movies again, like I would talk to grownups because my, my mm -hmm. friends weren't weren't interested at all in any of the movies I saw. So who did you, when you saw a movie mm -hmm. like Topper, who did you talk to about it? I mean, I was watching a lot of that stuff when I was really young, you know, six, seven, eight. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I mean, I didn't really have friends until high school. <laughs> so, and then in high school, all of my friends were in, super into movies, um, new movies, old movies. We would go to the New Beverly then and, and yeah. other repertory houses, the silent movie theater when they used to show silent movies. Yes. and. And so that was sort of, you know, that was probably 50% of my social life. And the other 50% was like punk rock and mm -hmm. indie rock and going to concerts. Wow. So they, all these things were kind of melded together. And, and you'd get the LA Weekly, which was just the Bible of everything that was happening in LA. And you'd just sort of like mark like, okay, on Tuesday, we're going to go to this movie. And on Wednesday, we're going to go to this club. And, mm -hmm. and you just figure it all out. And did you follow it all? I mean, like in my, I, I got the very tail end of uh, uh, Paul, uh, Pauline Kale, like a little, mm -hmm. little bit. I got New York Magazine, and so there was like David Denby and a little bit of movie reviewers. And, and then, of course, it was like Siskel and Ebert, mm -hmm. not their newspaper show, but I'd watch them on TV. So did you... You know, it, that's like when film criticism <laughs> seemed important, was actually yeah. sort of an important skill. Oh, yeah. I mean, Siskel and Ebert were huge celebrities to me. And yeah. then I went to college at um, the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, and mm -hmm. it was right when they named their massive movie theater after Gene Siskel. Um, so you go, I mean, even leaving Los Angeles and going to Chicago, they were even bigger celebrities there. Yeah. Um, but I, I mean, I read the LA Times, you know, we were an LA Times household and I would read the calendar section, you know, cover to cover every day. But other than that, I didn't really get into film criticism until until college. And so, and did you have any, did you want to be a writer? Like, how did that come about? You went to school, at, where did you go to school? I went to the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, oh, and Chicago. then I went to the San Francisco Art Institute for undergrad. And um, I wanted to do a lot of different things. You know, mm -hmm. I was just kind of interested in visual culture. Um, but I, I learned about experimental film and, and a little bit about the history of Hollywood and, and the artistry of Hollywood um, in art school. And I was basically making these sort of short videos, like personal diary films, and they gravitated towards being about the stuff I was watching. And mm -hmm. so after I finished undergraduate, I spent about six months back in L.A. trying to get a job, you know, probably in post-production. Uh, I really, really wanted to work on E! True Hollywood Stories. Um, <laughs> it was sort of the tail end of that. Yes. And I just was just like trying so hard to get an internship at E! Yeah. And this was just a few years before they kind of switched formats to all reality, yeah. you know. But I, like in the six months, I couldn't get a job. And in that time, I applied to grad schools. And I ended up going to NYU and getting a master's degree in cinema studies. And so at that point, I, when I was in school, I kind of had to decide if I was going to be an academic or something else. And I became right. a film critic. So when you were in school, because then I've said this many times, you know, when I was growing up, you know, the, this first serious book I was given on the movies mm -hmm. was called The Men Who Make the Movies. Uh -huh. So and there was there was a documentary on PBS. Mm -hmm. It was called The Men. It was only men. So I, I actually didn't think. It was this revelation to to discover that women could make movies, and and so when you were at school, was that same notion sort of perpetuated? 
I don't think I really thought about the gender imbalance in Hollywood or in movie making until I went to art school and learned about how it was somewhat different in the art world, you know, because like when you when you're a teenager and you learn about painting, you're pretty much learning about male painters. Mm -hmm. And then you go to art school and they're like, actually, the, the history of art is much more complex than just Picasso and right. Rembrandt and whoever. And you start hearing these stories about these female female artists and and the challenges they had and, and discovering their work. But there were no comparative classes talking about movies and, and talking about this sort of parallel history of people other than white men making movies. Mm -hmm. And so I, you know, slowly became interested in that stuff over the course of college and grad school. Um, but, you know, there I finished grad school in 2005. And up to that point, there still just wasn't a lot of historiography or history about being written yeah. about this stuff. It there, seems like very recently. Absolutely. And even now it's a challenge. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to write a biography of, of a woman in Hollywood who is not a, a household name. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm really, you know, it's, it's a hard pitch. And why is that? Why do you think that is? Well, I mean. It doesn't seem sexy enough or. Yeah, that's a literal phrase I've heard. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, I think, that, I think that it's just, I think there's a market out there for being able to publish biographies of men that people have never heard of. And then right. for women, it's. It's a doubly hard sell. So I, I'm trying to figure it out. <laughs> yes, it's very interesting because you've written so many books about movies. And when I was writing my book, again, it was always a fight to make it a movie book and not like gossipy, you know, then I did this and I did. I was like, I have no interest in writing. And I actually don't know how even how to write that kind of book and convincing people that there was an audience for movies. And I've always found there's a huge audience for movies. It's been like the one relatable thing. Yeah. I think movie books, though, don't sell consistently well. Mm -hmm. I'm sure yours did because you're a well-known person and it's fascinating, you know, but it's it's not always pu publishers don't perceive it as being the easiest sell. Yes, I agree. But I always but I believe it's the silent majority because mm -hmm. it's the one universal thing is that yeah. people, uh, you know, can talk about Rock Hudson or Doris Day or, you yeah. know. Any of these, th uh, any of these things. Okay, I want to talk about some of your books before we get to your podcast. Um, the what was the first book you wrote? It was a, a short critical biography of George Lucas. And why George Lucas? So I was approached by the French film magazine Cahiers de Cinéma, mm -hmm. who were starting an imprint of books, and they basically had a list of people that they were like they wanted to commission books on, and I chose uh -huh. three of them, <laughs> and one was George Lucas, one was Al Pacino, and one was Meryl Streep. Oh, I see, I see, because I would be, and and uh, I was going to say it was such an interesting. Uh, so what did you learn about George Lucas? Um, I, I didn't grow up watching the Star Wars movies. I yeah, wasn't really either. a fan of, of his work yeah. necessarily, but I was really interested in the idea of him as being a pioneering independent filmmaker uh -huh. and somebody who, um, when he was told he couldn't do something, he figured out how to do it. And so I, I, that was how I came into it. And I found out that in, you know, for most of his career that had been true. And, and then I also learned about his passion for experimental filmmaking and especially experimental animation and the ways these things that he was absorbing when he was a little bit younger um, were directly visually influential on things like Star Wars. So that kind of thing gave me a, a greater respect for movies that I wasn't necessarily a, like an emotional fan of. Mm -hmm. Did you get to talk to him at all? No, it was a critical biography. Oh, I see, I see. Yeah. Oh, that's... <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, and what about Al Pacino? Why did you why did you choose Al Pacino? I think just because I loved his movies. You yeah. know, I mean, so many of those movies are so foundational to the things that I love about acting. And yes, and um, and it was just kind of a way of talking about like the seventies turning into the eighties, uh -huh. and then. I think there was this, certainly like amongst the French, there was this perception that his career kind of ended with Carlito's way, right. um, that there wasn't anything interesting after. And so then it was a challenge to like try to look at the later career and find something interesting. Yeah, because, well, everybody sort of has to transition. Mm -hmm. um, and w what was it you discovered about uh, Al Pacino? Um, I, I think that there's this perception. He's a bohemian, like he's sort of an odd bohemian. To yeah, me. well, certainly he's dedicated part of his life to the theater and mm -hmm. And again, he's somebody like George Lucas, who like when he when he was told that, you know, you couldn't do these sort of independent theater projects, he kind of doubled down on them, which is really interesting. But um, 
you know, I think that there's sort of this perception of him as being an over actor or somebody who's very loud. And it was really interesting um, kind of examining the different performances and yeah. and looking for the nuance and looking for the ways in which he actually like uses his craft and in a, a much more layered way than I think some people have an impression of. I noticed uh, in one of your sort of list of mm. undiscovered movies, you have Scarecrow. Uh-huh. I know, isn't that a crazy... I love that movie. Yeah, when <laughs> I was a kid, it played in rotation on television quite oh, a bit wow. and then always edited. So a lot of movies I saw, I was like, okay, that was a strange cut there. I mean, even non-edited, that movie is it, no, not the most me, linear narrative. Yeah, but he's so good in that, yeah. film, as is Gene Hackman. But uh, what yeah. an interesting film. He did a lot of really, did you, what do you think of Bobby Deerfield? Did you like oh, that? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's that's another, another weird... movie where I wish it was easier to see. You yeah. Know? And, and the other one that I thought, I would love to just, you know, have like a retrospective screening of was Revolution. Oh, now that one I haven't seen in years. Yeah. But you're right. That's hard to see. And that one, you know, I've never seen the original version of it because by the time they put it out on video, he, Pacino, like recorded this new narration for it. Okay. And it's Pacino, I think, probably in his late 50s, recording uh -huh. narration over footage of him at age 29 or something. <laughs> so it has this strange experimental quality of, of an older man looking back on the past. Oh, that's funny. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Uh, I, I love your perspective on uh, when you see things. Do you, do you always <laughs> add, because, I, I, again, on your show, you sort of... I, I think you psychically have to get, you know, get into the what the person is perceiving a little bit, you know, and I, I enjoy that. Thanks. But, you know, don't you feel, though, you, you feel like I need to speak for that person or sometimes I feel that more than others. But I feel like one thing that is consistent is that I just I try to put myself in the position of, of the filmmaker or the actress or whoever it is and just think about what it was like to be alive at that time in that context experiencing these things mm -hmm. and how that would have how just you know being a person in 1954 or whenever right. it was who had had this past and was in this moment like what the emotions would have been yeah i wonder if that's something you know that that uh and there's so there's not as many uh female you know people talking about movies there's always sort of men and I caught recently William uh, Friedkin uh, interviewing Fritz Lang. Oh, wow. And it's very, very interesting. But again, uh, part of what was so frustrating about it was that Fritz Lang was giving him these huge signals about his work. Uh -huh. and, and Friedkin was... It wasn't really hitting him. And right. so sometimes when these guys interview the old folks, and you know, Bogdanovich did this too... It's like, okay, they just get sort of the gruff guy. Oh, we shot it and we went home. Whereas I do think that women have a way of kind of having the person open up a, a little bit more and maybe reveal what they really were trying to do, you know, with the with the film. But when you said, that triggered me when you said, like, yeah. what the 50s were like and what the mentality of the, you know, of the world was like. Do you have a favorite era of movies? I think it changes all the time. The 50s definitely are a time for me that I'm fascinated by all the contradictions. And, yeah, me and, too. And, you know, post-World War II, the society becoming more conservative and, and women, like, you know, went into the workplace and, and more African-Americans had more jobs and more access to power during the war than they had before. And then the doors started closing in the 50s. And at the same time, Hollywood is undergoing this, you know, struggle to compete with television and, mm -hmm. and to compete with rock and roll. And so the screen is getting wider and, and the colors are getting more saturated and they're bringing in things like, you know, CinemaScope and, and going to foreign countries to shoot on location to try to get people back into the movie theaters. Yeah. But the, there's, the subject of so many of those movies is sexual repression. <laughs> Yeah. So the, it's just, there's just so much going on that I'm fascinated by. I know. I love the 50s, too. Everybody seems psychotic. Like, <laughs> there's, you know, I, but I, 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 you know, I love that. Um, okay. Let's talk about your book about Howard Hughes. Now, that must have been incredible. Uh, I recently saw, and, you, and I, I know you're talking about uh, the women is life and Terry Moore. Mm. And Terry Moore is still around. Yeah, she's still kicking. <laughs> and did you get to talk to Terry Moore? I made a choice not to because uh -huh. the book is about 10 women and she was the only one who was still alive. Oh, and I so see. I didn't want it to turn it into the Terry Moore story. Right. I also, I, I had access to about 350 pages of depositions she had given. And so I, I had quite a bit of information 
from her that had never been published, in addition to the two books that she published about her time with Howard Hughes. Wow. Depositions for her. Was this her divorce? or No. Um, so when Howard Hughes died, he didn't leave behind a will. And oh, so right. there was a massive legal battle that lasted for years and years and years to try to figure out how his estate would be divided and kind of more importantly, which state would get to tax it. And so Terry gave three or four different depositions over the years about her relationship to him because she was asking for a portion of the estate. Wow. And you, one of the things I mentioned is you talk about the pre-Howard Hughes before his plane crash and then Mm -hmm. post-Howard Hughes. So what's Howard Hughes like before the plane crash? Well, especially when he first comes to Los Angeles in the in the mid 1920s, he's very young, extremely handsome, very confident in some ways, but also very socially awkward. Um, so one of his girlfriends from around that time, Billy Dove, who was a major silent film star, she talks about how he would sit down at a dinner table and she thought he was like a zombie. Um, and he would just kind of follow her around. And she was like, who is this guy? Like, why won't he leave me alone? Mm-hmm. But once you actually got one-on-one with him, then he could be charming. And I think that's um, how he kind of worked his magic on a lot of these women. Well, he had a lot of, he had a lot of girlfriends. He did, yeah. I, I think to some extent his, um, his sort of sexual escapades were a little bit exaggerated in the media. Uh-huh. I mean, they certainly, it, it became news. He was so famous and exciting just for you know being this incredibly rich young guy that it became news if he was ever seen with anyone. And so I think that to some extent the, the press coverage exaggerated some things that weren't really relationships into relationships. But certainly there's many documented relationships as well. And what about some of the uh, the films that he made? Mm-hmm. I mean, I guess notably like Hell's Angels or, you know, any... Did he have an impact on those films, like the artistic impact? Or do you think he just hired the right people? On Hell's Angels and The Outlaw, for better or for worse, he absolutely had an artistic <laughs> impact. Um, uh, you know, I think there are interesting things about both of those movies, and neither of them are great movies. Yeah. Um, but in both cases, he's so fascinated with the bodies of the women he cast in them. I mean, he literally, like, The Outlaw is shot by Greg Toland, one of the great cinematographers, and he literally asks him at certain points to point the camera down Jane Russell's blouse. Yeah. You know, um, he's just, he's obsessed with, with, with breasts. <laughs> nobody, okay. nobody ever, uh, nobody ever diagnosed him in any way. Was it, it, something with his mother or something like that? I don't know. Well, actually, one thing that's interesting that came up in my research is that yeah. there's this guy Raymond Fowler who was a psychologist. Um, he actually just died recently, and I was able to look at his files on Howard Hughes. Oh wow! And he was hired by the lawyers for the Howard Hughes's estate after Hughes died to do what was called a psychological autopsy. Uh Um, which was basically a history of Howard Hughes's psychology over the course of his life um, that would help defend the estate from various lawsuits, supposedly. Um, And so he basically found that Hughes was never diagnosed with anything um, and that if he saw any psychiatrist, he was doing so in in such secret that Uh like no diagnosis would be recorded. But he speculated that he had... um, a sort of traumatic disassociative disorder that stemmed from childhood where his mother was both too smothering and then kind of abandoned him or Hughes felt like he abandoned him when she sent him off to summer camp. Right. Okay. And then both of his parents died when he was a teenager. Mm -hmm. And so he's somebody who's had never really had to function in the real world and is suddenly at age 19, you know, thrust into it with all this money. Right. Um, So that is kind of the beginning of some of his, social stuff. Um, you know, also Raymond Fowler, Fowler speculated that he might have had undiagnosed epilepsy um, because he got into many, 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 many car crashes and plane crashes. Oh, oh wow. Interesting. So then after the plane crash, then what, it, you know, I mean, who knows, maybe something happened with his He head had a massive, massive head injuries in the 1946 crash, as well as his lungs collapsed and yeah. his body, you know, he was, he was intubated, like his body was being sort of put back together over the course of several weeks. Yeah. So maybe his decisions weren't. Yeah. Certainly his behavior changes after 1946. I mean, it was not, you know, conventional right. before that. And he was certainly overextended once World War II began, because in addition to being a filmmaker and a ladies' man, he was also a defense contractor. Mm-hmm. Um, but things do get much stranger after 1946. 
The is he part of the Hughes when they have the Hughes Corporation? That was that him? Mm -hmm. that, oh, and that so that's still Hughes in, Aviation and yeah. yeah. Is that still in existence in any form? Like, did he have any relatives? What, you know? Well, he did have relatives, distant relatives, to whom the estate was divided amongst. But uh -huh. um, before his death, he actually sold off quite a bit of his corporation. Um, and the, you know, what was left was divided amongst like 17 people. And obviously there's been a couple of movies about him. Do you think the movies were accurate? I mean, Warren Beatty always, I guess for years, he said he was going to do a movie and then he, he did a movie, which mm -hmm. sort of was an element of Howard Hughes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he plays a character called Howard Hughes in it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but are they accurate or can mm -hmm. they be accurate? I think there are accurate aspects of The Aviator and Rules Don't Apply. Um, I think the thing that's most fascinating to me about The Aviator is is watching um, Hughes try to make these movies, you know, and the, the specific things that he's interested in, like in the shooting of Hell's Angels and the editing of, of The Outlaw. Um, some of those things are accurate. Some of his relationships with women I don't think are particularly accurate in that film. Um, his relationship with Ava Gardner, for instance, is as portrayed in that film is not exactly the way that I've read that it was like. Right. Um, but of course you have to take licenses. Um, the rules don't apply, I think is more of Warren Beatty kind of combining his experience in Hollywood when he arrived mm. with Howard Hughes. And then the care, the way that he plays Howard Hughes, I actually found really fascinating because he, he's much too old for the part of life that he's portraying Howard Hughes as. He's about 30 years older than Howard Hughes was at that time. Right. And, but there's something that he's capturing about aging, like being like mm. a once beautiful person and a once glamorous person and aging and like watching the next generation come up behind you that I think is fascinating. And I actually saw that movie right after I had come back from um, Texas where it's been 11 days just reading telegrams and things that Howard wow. Hughes had sent. Mm -hmm. And I, ca I felt like the performance captured something of this character that I had sort of gotten to know in the files. Yeah, it seemed like an amalgamation because in something that I had read when, when you were describing an incident with Terry Moore, I said, oh, that looks like that was like a scene in Rules Don't Apply. When he when in the got, screening room, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, so, so you know, who knows? Yeah. So some things, but he obviously has a fascination for, uh, you know, for, you know, for people, and um, and so then ultimately, would you like to see another movie made about Howard Hughes based on your book? Or I think that if somebody was going to do something based on my book, I would hope that it is more about the women, um, because I I mm. kind of used Howard Hughes I felt as a Trojan horse to tell the stories of. 10 actresses and their experiences in Hollywood from the 20s to the end of the 50s. Yeah. So um, I think that would be a good TV show. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Um, so let's get to your podcast. Uh, you must remember this. I, I must ask, although it's boring, how did the podcast come about? Just, you know, mm -hmm. how, how did you get the idea for it to, to do it? Because now that it's here, you go, oh, well, why, why isn't this always here? <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it started in 2014, and mm -hmm. I was just sort of in a, a professional period where I, I had a part-time job um, teaching at Chapman Graduate School, but I wasn't doing a lot. And I was just looking, I had quit my job as a film critic at the LA Weekly about a year earlier because I had wanted to try to transition into doing more stuff about film history, you know, like the stuff that I had gone to graduate school to study and less about new Hollywood. And But I was just, you know, there's just not a lot of jobs out there for a film historian. And so I, I thought that I could maybe try to create something on my own just as an example of what I wanted to do, the, just mm -hmm. the, the kind of research I wanted to do and the more contemporary way of looking at the past. Um, so I just created like a pilot episode of it and then I put it out on the internet and I asked for feedback and I got some feedback and then I just kind of found my way over the next couple of months um, and pretty quickly it, it got attention. It was written about in Entertainment Weekly and the AV Club and that allowed me to um, join a podcasting network um, and to sort of, it gave me the excuse, even though I wasn't making money on it and didn't for quite a while, it gave me ex an excuse to sort of treat it as a startup, to treat it as something like a project that I was investing all of my time in and would eventually be rewarded. And it, I did. <laughs> and the first one was about Kim Novak. Yeah. Oh, yeah. she's the yeah. greatest. Huh? Yeah. Um, and so it's in order to make it a, 
you know, an entertaining podcast, it do you go, do you approach each one with a sort of a theme or a story that you want to tell? It can't obviously just be a journalistic expression. It's got to be you must have form an opinion about, you know, each one as you go into it or um, yeah, I, I feel like I, I try to form the opinion based on what I learn um, and my opinions of the movies, you know, I mean, because I do also have a, f a background as a film critic. Mm -hmm. um, part of the show is film criticism. Well, so I feel like so many of the stories are, you know, have, have they, they have a slightly sad twinge because you haven't heard of these people, you know, Pig and Whistle or, you know, Gene yeah. Seberg or things like that. And so they're, do, do you pick people? again, to showcase a certain, like, oh, you need to know about this story. Well, what I've done over the past few years is I've, I've created seasons, because, sort of built around a theme, because it's a little bit easier for me to, to manage the material that way. Mm -hmm. um, and so the, it's, it's never that the primary idea is, is to tell people about films or stars that they might not have heard of. It's more, it's really just I'm guided by what I'm interested in at the moment. But then within the seasons and within the episodes, the thing that's fun for me is discovering films that I haven't seen before and, and discovering information that I've never known before or could never have expected. And so maybe that stuff, that is the stuff that kind of bubbles up to the surface when I'm putting the episodes together. Well, that is always like the thing about Hollywood is you go, oh my God, like who what extras lived in that building or, yeah. you know what I mean? You go by and you go, oh. you look at Ben-Hur, you know, hundreds of people. Do you, did you ever have one that uh, didn't, you said somehow it's not working or they've you dropped stories or whatever on certain people or events? Yeah, I actually, I had an idea to do a series about the three main stars of Rebel Without a Cause who mm -hmm. both died all three of them died you know, sort of before their time. And I started working on it, but um, you know, I don't want to say anything negative about people who might be listening, but I've, I haven't found a good book about James Dean. Um, the ones I found, I just found um, either not satisfying, not really rigorous in the research, or like a little too salacious. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm still looking, um, if I could find like a treasure trove of information about him, then right. I think I, I might be able to reapproach it. But I mean, I'd love to like sort of tell the story of Natalie Wood and Salminio and, and get it all in there somehow. Well, it's so interesting. I mean, I'm going to go back to what I said before is that there, I feel anyway, there's almost a psychic f little element to you you want to tell a person's story and again so some of it isn't always in the books but you mm -hmm. just get a certain feeling i mean for instance i'd read so many books about marlon brando and i read his own book but mm -hmm. then when i met marlon brando it was like uh, i i you just he the person i met seemed so radically and and he offered a lot of differing things yeah. that then were in the books right. that, that were written about him. So it can be only one person's impression. Right. You know, but, uh, well, I'd like to see, well, that's very interesting. James Dean. What about his early New York days? You know, yeah. Before he came out to Hollywood. Yeah. The, the theater. Yeah. The acting actor studio time. It's a, uh, that you know that that's tough because again you've got a like certain armchair sensibility of of you never really know the person. Uh, for instance, another show you did, uh, somebody I really love is Gloria Graham, uh -huh. and I sort of feel that what you said about James Dean about Gloria Graham, like mm -hmm. people even though people say things about her, I'm like I get the feeling that isn't really true. <laughs> and we I, I I've interviewed people here, John Hurd, people mm -hmm. that knew her. Again, this, some of the stuff, you know, and what was your impression of uh, Gloria Graham? I mean, I just love her on screen, you yeah. know? I just, I, I've always loved her screen presence, and I think that she's somebody who is maybe not considered on that sort of top level of stars from that period, right. but I think she should be. So, yeah, very interesting. Now, of course, in the news, poor uh, D Doris Day passed away, yeah. and she figures prominently in your, uh, uh, the, Ma the Manson family so maybe you could talk a little bit about that episode. Yeah. Um, so I did a series of the podcast called Charles Manson's Hollywood, and I actually did it because of Doris Day. Um, I was watching TCM, and they were doing, you know, a series of her movies. And I, you know, just 
I realized that I didn't know that much about her life. And so I Googled her and I found her, obit- not her obituary, her son's obituary, um, because this was several years ago. And, you know, there's just one line that's, you know, he he was an associate of Charles Manson. And some people believe that Charles Manson sent the Manson family to Cielo Drive on the night that Sharon Tate was killed looking for Terry Melcher, Doris Day's son. And that was something I had never known. And so I just started kind of putting all these pieces together because it was fascinating to me that you could draw such a direct line between Doris Day and Charles Manson. They mm-hmm. seem like such mm-hmm. different cultural icons. And then I, I did 12 podcast episodes about it. Yeah, that was, I know, that's a really, uh, really good one. Now, and currently you've do, you're have you doing fake news, Hollywood Babylon, like stories from Hollywood Babylon. Yeah, I, I did that in the fall. Yeah, it's... Um, uh, based on Kenneth Anger's book, yeah. Yeah, that was a book we all grew up with. We, yeah. I believed everything in the book. Right. <laughs> so what, what were some of the fake yeah. uh, or el- elaborated, you know, uh, I mean, tragically, of course, there's the R- Raymond Navarro story. But they were all like so mm. some of the ones uh, that you feature. Yeah. So the, the idea between, behind the season is that I think for a lot of people, Hollywood Babylon is their introduction to a, a certain period of time and – and certain characters from Hollywood history. And I think most people don't have any idea that Kenneth Anger was somebody who was getting a lot of his stories kind of through a game of telephone. And in some cases, he was willfully exaggerating things or adding details to make them more scandalous and and to kind of make it more campy and funny. Right. Um, But, you know, when you read it now, there's an unmistakable misogyny in a lot of it. Um, So, I mean, you know, some of the things like uh, there was a Mexican actress, Lupe Velez, um, who committed suicide when she was in her 30s in the 1940s. And he claims that she threw up the pills that she took because she had eaten too much Mexican food and that she had been found with her head in the toilet. And the actual, you know, autopsy reports and all of that suggest that she was found in her bed. You know, so many details of that were incorrect um, but his version is just kind of tinged with this sort of jokey racism um, and that's you know pretty typical of of some of the stories in in Hollywood Babylon yeah very dark um, do you from from doing so many stories about actresses uh, Linda Darnell is another one that pops out yeah. just sort of you know just very sad like w- w- did you get an overall impression of how challenging it must have been to be a contract player and striving for success in some way here in this town oh yeah absolutely and those are some of the stories that are most fascinating to me because you know i may maybe it's a little different today i don't know that being a movie star has the same allure that it did but certainly there's a period in the middle of the century where if you were the most beautiful person in your small town everybody told you you should be in movies and then you were young and you believed it and then you came to hollywood and you found that you know, at best, you would be paid, you know, maybe fifty, a hundred dollars a week, um, and it was so hard to actually, you know, get those opportunities to be a star. Um, and Linda Darnell is somebody who, um, I, I guess, I probably saw her for the first time in um, Letter to Three Wives, um, but she's, you know, made so many interesting movies, and she was so gorgeous, just like unbelievably beautiful. And then when you find out that her life was, you know, she married a much older guy because she was sort of like searching for a father figure and dealing with alcoholism. And then she died in a horrible fire. You know, there's just so many things that, where it kind of helps you to understand the richness of, of this person's life. And it, it makes their work, I think, more poignant. Joseph Mankiewicz uh, pops up in that um, mm-hmm. One is having a romance with her, and he. Are you like me, where you bo- you know, are you catalog books, and you're like, okay, Joe Mankiewicz pops up with every <laughs> like he's referenced yeah. a lot. In- I mean, that's kind of how my Howard Hughes book started. <laughs> oh. Was just like making a list of like all the women who he supposedly had affairs with, and then trying to figure out like what of these were real relationships, right. what were publicity, like. I mean, you know, I think a lot of people think that he had an affair with with Jean Harlow, and I can't find any evidence that they did. In fact, like she, everything points to the fact that she really hated him. Yeah. Um, But yeah, Joe Mankiewicz is another one where it's you know it's Judy Garland, it's it's Linda Darnell, it's it's her, it's them. Yeah. The number one for me is Roddy McDowell. His Uh name, and I got to know Roddy, and he was wonderful. And he pops up in more books. (laughs) Did you ever read? Piper Laurie's book? Oh, no, I haven't read that one. I should. Yeah. 
lost her virginity to Ronald Reagan. Nice. <laughs> so l- let me ask you about research. So yeah. again, one of my favorite ways to do research is just through books, like mm-hmm. through through people's bios where you go, well, it's probably true if they read it in their bio, you know. Mm-hmm. So how do you do your research for each episode? And mm-hmm. I know you at the end you sort of list the sources, but is it books? Is it the internet? Is it the library? It's not really the internet, no. Um, maybe I'll go to somebody's Wikipedia Good. page to like <laughs> look at the sources on the Wikipedia page, like right. which, which books and articles are, are referenced. Um, and I generally only use IMDb for dates of movies. Yeah. Um, but I, I spend a lot of time at the Academy Library. Mm-hmm. Um, I buy a lot of used books um i i mostly i would say i use books and i use old newspapers and and old magazines like photoplay and confidential to some extent but i mean i do think you have to be skeptical right. about anything that's sort of released in tandem with the hollywood publicity machine you know another area that pops up for me that you wouldn't think is uh, auction catalogs oh yeah that's interesting so for instance I don't know if it was Glenn Ford or Rita Hayworth, but it was a number of years ago. They sold all these love letters oh, wow. between Rita Hayworth and Glenn Ford. So yeah. and they were pretty steamy. You know? yeah. It's a shame the family didn't, didn't hold on to them. But sometimes like so that for me has become an interesting reference because yeah. it's like if they're, they're actual letters or things like that. Um, the, the same thing happened with telegrams between Catherine Hepburn and Howard Hughes. Is that's yeah. how people know some of the details of their relationship. Of course, Catherine Hepburn also wrote very detailed about their relationship in her book. Yeah, well, and then, you know, you can also think, well, they're, you know, that when everybody has their ver- sort of version of, right. you know, of what. Of, of what course, they... Scotty Bowers' version of Catherine Hepburn's life is different than Catherine Hepburn's <laughs> version. What do you think of that, Scotty Bowers? <laughs> I, I like. I, I think it's exaggerated, but I don't know. Is it yeah. totally accurate? I don't know. You know, I haven't met him or anything. Yeah. Um, it's, it's a little convenient. I. You know, there was a there. There's a book about Spencer Tracy by James Curtis, in mm-hmm. which he kind of uh, takes Scotty Bowers to task a little bit. Um, because James Curtis in his 800-page book found no evidence that Spencer Tracy ever had gay relationships. Um, right. And, you know, he I think his phrase about Scotty Bowers is that his information is uh, cheerfully unverifiable. Yes, I, 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 that, that's where I tend to go. Now, another episode that is, um, I don't know, maybe one of your more moving episodes is uh, we're talking about Carol Lombard mm-hmm. and the death of uh, Carol Lombard and Clark Gable going to see going to the plane crash. So talk a little bit about that that episode and how that came about. Yeah, um, I did a, a series of episodes about um, the way different stars responded to World War II. And, you know, Carol Lombard died coming home from a, a trip to sell war bonds. Um, she was try- hurrying to get back to her husband, Clark Gable, who was shooting a movie with Lana Turner. Um, I think any wife would right. <laughs> want to be around for that. So she was you know, put on kind of a small plane and it crashed in the mountains of Nevada. And uh, Clark, they wouldn't confirm that she had died. And they brought Clark Gable out to Las Vegas to wait for the news that his wife was dead. And when I just thought about this idea of Clark Gable, you know, this, the one of the toughest screen personas, the most manly screen persona, when I thought about him sitting alone in a motel in Las Vegas, drinking, waiting to be told what he knew, which was that his wife was dead, I just started crying, and so you can hear that yeah. in the podcast episode. Yeah, it's uh, it's you know. Do you do you ever feel like the stars are reaching out and thanking you for? <laughs> I do, but maybe that's just me. <laughs> I don't know I mean, about you, that. Do you but... feel like a certain connection to to you know to old Hollywood to keeping it alive? Mm-hmm. I guess is the. Well, I mean, I would say two things. One is that, as I said, I do really try to feel figure out what it would feel like to be in these situations. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think I'm just really interested in, in taking people who we think of as being images and icons and thinking about what it felt like to be them as just as human beings. Um, and then the other thing is just that I love these movies, you know, and in terms of keeping it alive, I just really want people to continue to watch them and in, in w- whatever medium they're available in going forward. The a couple others that are uh, interesting for me, uh, Gene Tierney. Oh, again, yeah. And just a tragic. Yeah. Tragic life. Uh, and her autobiography, if people are interested, is called Self-Portrait, and it's really, really beautifully written. 
Oh, so talk a little bit about <laughs> Jean Tierney. Just Jean I mean, Tierney, so the, stunning and yeah, the great brunette star of films like um, *Leave Her to Heaven*. Um, Laura. Yeah. Uh, she, uh, she was, this is again from my series about stars during World War II. She went to the Hollywood Canteen, which was, um, a place that was set up so that servicemen could basically meet young actresses and young stars who would serve them sandwiches and coffee. Um, and you know, she was meeting fans there and then she ended up giving birth to a baby who had very, very serious birth defects, um, who was never able to live a conventional life, was institutionalized her whole life. And a couple of years after she gave birth to this child, she saw a fan in, you know, another situation. And the fan said, you know, I met you once before. I, I went to the Hollywood canteen and it turned out I had German measles and I knew <gasps> I knew I was sick, but I just had to meet my favorite star, Jean Tierney. Yeah. And so it it's you know, it's because um, Jean Tierney was exposed to the German measles that she probably gave birth to this very sick child. Mm -hmm. And so they talk about, like, again, when you're reading a book, like when these older books, they, they just go, and then they cracked up. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but we don't really know, like, what that means. But, like, she, she really had a breakdown and mm -hmm. went home, and, and it's true, she went home and worked in a department store and... I mean, well, she was institutionalized and, you know, she had a troubled marriage to the fashion designer Oleg Cassini. And mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, I mean, she she left Hollywood. Yeah. And then and then tried to make a sort of a comeback years later. Yeah. Do you ever watch those shows, you know, like you bet, I mean, where they come stars like Francis Farmer come back years. I mean, do you have a morbid mm -hmm. interest in stars like that or is it? I don't know that it's a morbid. I mean, I. I think it depends on the star, you know, um, but I am interested in kind of like the fullness of a life, uh -huh. you know, I, like I, I used to watch, as I said, the E! True Hollywood stories, and I feel like yeah. they would kind of like breeze through the last like 20 or 30 years of somebody's life. Right. Um, whereas, you know, when you think about it, it's a long time. It's often more time than somebody was famous. Oh, I, like I said, I, that's how I started. The, I was fascinated. Like Elizabeth Scott is at the gym. Right. You know, like <laughs> she still has to go to the gym. You know, like yeah. that, you know, that those kind of things always, you know. Um, okay, so a couple of my last questions. Uh, do you have favorite things in Hollywood that you like to go? The Formosa mm -hmm. or the Walk of Fame or places like that that are um, unusual? Yeah. Well, I mean, I don't know if it's unusual, but I do love to see movies at the Egyptian at, mm -hmm. that the American yeah. Cinematheque puts on and then go across the street to Musso and Frank and have a yeah. steak and a martini. <laughs> Musso and Frank is great. Yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, one of my favorite places in L.A. that I, I don't think a lot of people know about and hopefully still exists for a long time is Eddie's uh, Eddie Brandt's Saturday Matinee. Yes. Um, where they still rent VHS tapes and they rent, um, you know, almost any movie you could possibly want to see. They have a copy of it. It might be a DVD that was burned from a VHS tape that was taped from a television broadcast. Yeah. But they probably have it. Uh, did you see that the four, they're working on the Formosa? They're yeah, I kinda, saw. They're, there's just like a train car behind it. Have yeah, you seen that? But the, did I miss something? What's well, I mean, I, I I haven't been there in a long time. I do. I so they're adding a train car. <laughs> it says Pacific Dining Car. Oh, really? Is it from the Pacific Dining Car? I, that's why I was like, yeah. is it a mashup? I don't, I don't know. know. <laughs> no, it's I didn't. I heard that they're coming back, but I I haven't. Yeah, if you go by that. Formosa, it's a, it's an actual train. So yeah. I don't know if it's. I, I was like, I, have I not driven down? Th is it the train from <laughs> Sunset, or is it the Pacific Dining Car restaurant from? Yeah. But no, it's a train. It's an actual train. Um, uh, an actual train car. The. Um, the any other places that you like i like the groundman's that's my favorite. oh yeah yeah it's great to see movies there and i love it that the tcm fest has kind of taken up camp there yeah um and camp being the right <laughs> the perfect yeah the perfect word that that's my that's my favorite thing is the handprint footprint because it's so silly i don't know yeah and everyone <laughs> and that they gets, still do it yeah the fact that they get so uh you know excited about it yeah um any upcoming? You've taken a hiatus, mm -hmm. and when are you coming back? I don't know yet because I'm uh, trying to figure out kind of 
some stuff behind the scenes in terms of the business of podcasting. Right. But I'm, I am writing a new season right now. And so hopefully we'll be able to get it out there by the end of the summer. All righty. Great. Well, thank you so much for, for being here. I hope it was painless. Oh, thank you. It was great. <laughs> <laughs> Look for Karina's podcast. You must remember this podcast.com with new episodes coming out hopefully this summer. And her book, Seduction, Lies and Stardom in Howard Hughes Hollywood, is out now, coming out in paperback soon. In November. In November. She is at Karina Longworth on Twitter, and her website is videoc.com. Thank you, Karina. And you can buy Ileana's book, I Blame Dennis Hopper, out in paperback at bookstores and at Amazon. It's a great read. You should buy it. Also, like our page on Facebook and check out our website, ilianaspodcast.com. Wow, that t- took a long time. Uh <laughs> camera but thank you thanks everyone for listening as we always end our show everyone's life is like a movie with a beginning a middle and an end and today is the end of our movie thank you so much karina for being here and listen to the podcast all righty from producers maria menounos kevin undergaro phil svitek and the entire popcorn talk network we would like to thank you for tuning in for questions or comments be sure to visit popcorntalk.com i'm sir richard wentworth and this has been a presentation of the popcorn talk network